Formula One is the fastest, most extreme form of sanctioned single-seat auto racing in the world. It's truly the sport of kings, where ultra-rich teams build expensive, low-flying death machines posing as automobiles race in extreme conditions and receive huge payouts. But the sport also has its share of secrets, from illegal craftsmanship to outright corruption. In this video, we're going to expose the five dirty secrets you didn't know about Formula One. Let's get started. Number five, the richest teams dominate every race weekend. Look up rich man's sport in the proverbial dictionary and it will surely be defined as Formula One. It's not uncommon for the top seven or so spots to be gobbled up by the sport's four richest teams on any given race. In fact, it happens quite often, with only occasionally unforeseen accidents preventing Mercedes, Ferrari, Red Bull, or Williams from holding down the front of the pack every weekend. These teams have such a stranglehold on the sport that they get, according to the New York Times, tens of millions of dollars per season to simply show up on race day. Meanwhile, the sport's poorest teams regularly and repeatedly struggle to compete while battling for last place with financial problems as severe as their race performances. The rich teams are so dominant, in fact, that they sell ready-made cars to smaller, less rich teams, with the likes of Mercedes, Ferrari, Red Bull, and McLaren arguing that this promotes competition and keeps more teams involved in the sport. This competitive and financial disparity makes Formula One one of the most lopsided sports in the entire world, while also paying out some of the highest rewards. The difference between the front teams and the back teams is too big. Manor Racing director Dave Ryan told the New York Times, Ryan acknowledges that the best teams deserve more money, but I think the gap is just massive at the moment and it needs to be looked at in a slightly different manner, he states. Massive is probably the best way to describe the competitive gap, as even the most diehard of Formula One fans are growing tired of the same lack of front to back competition week in and week out. Number 4 The Sport is Mired in Corruption In 2016, bottom feeders Saber and Force India put in a formal complaint with the European Union over how Formula One doles out its fat stacks of cash, with the sport receiving upwards of $1 billion every year from business deals and partnerships. Apparently only 60% goes to the racing teams, with the majority and minority owners, CV Capital Partners and Bernie Ecclestone, respectively, stuffing the rest into their already fat pockets. Ecla Stone also made the call to sign individual deals with the richest teams, leaving the least competitive to fend for themselves. For example, Ferrari's individually arranged participation fee totals more than the bottom five teams' combined earnings. That's not exactly the kind of practice that promotes fair competition. Many human rights activists are particularly fond of Formula One's decision to hold a race in Baku, the capital of Azbakistan, paving over the fact that the prisons are packed full of dissenters, activists, and anyone else who throws a wrench in the aristocrat's well-oiled propaganda machine. Azerbaijan hosts a whole plethora of social and political problems, including the steady devaluation of their currency, regular protests, increasing poverty, and gross corruption. All of them Ilham Aliyev aims to sport wash, according to the Panama Papers, by hosting relatively boring and unspectacular Grand Prix. By accepting the Aliyev's loop jobs, Formula One is, like it or not, complicit with Azbajadan's corruption. Sure, money talks, but a whole slew of countries are eager to join the Formula One circuit. Countries that, you know, don't jail anyone who speaks out. Yes, when it comes down to it, Formula One simply races by their own rules. And rule number one, make that money. Number three, Drivers are extremely fit and drink insane amounts of fluids. P. 
people tend to not think of drivers as the most fit of all athletes in the sports world, but Formula One pilots maintain insane physical shape. Formula One claims its drivers are among the most conditioned athletes in the world as the sport trumps all other forms of automobile racing in terms of the physical demands on the driver's body. In F1, drivers must be able to sustain upward of 3.5 Gs of cornering forces and deal with the insane heat of the cockpit on some intensely hot circuits for the entire duration of a race, all while maintaining razor sharp focus. It's not uncommon for drivers to lose 6 pounds during a race. That's why drivers are always subject to a weight check upon completion. Formula drivers tend to favor cardiovascular workouts over strength training since increased muscle mass means increased weight, which isn't good for shaving seconds off one's lap time. Swimming, running, and cycling tend to be the most common forms of exercise though drivers have especially designed rigs that develop the most important muscles of all, the neck and chest. Because the g-forces present when turning an F1 car can make the driver's helmet and head weigh more than five times its actual weight, strong neck are of vital importance. Also crucial are a driver's arms and core, as steering one of those low-flying aircraft over the course of a race is pretty intense. Lastly, reaction time can mean the difference between a successful overtake or crashing out or, in some cases, life and death. So drivers like to smack away at Batak reaction boards to keep up their hand-eye coordination. Number 2. The Sport is a Logistical Nightmare Imagine for a moment that it's your job to make sure all of your Formula 1 team's equipment makes it halfway across the globe for the next race, sometimes only one week following the last one. We're talking crates full of computers, multiple sets of tires, the ridiculously expensive and intricate cars themselves, not to mention trade secrets and developments that must be kept under wraps. Sounds like a lot of responsibility, huh? Well, that's only the tip of Formula One's logistical nightmare of an iceberg. Every Formula One team travels roughly 100,000 miles per year. The problem isn't even necessarily moving the equipment as much as making sure everything runs smoothly on an incredibly tight schedule. All things considered, it's enough to make your head spin and crash into a wall. Races taking place in Europe aren't such a big problem, as every current Formula 1 team is based out of the sport's home continent. Teams can just pack up all their goodies and decked out customized trucks and hit the road. Races on other continents, such as Australia and the Americas, pose a much greater problem, requiring chartered cargo planes loaded with specialized crates that take up almost every inch of available space. Sometimes there isn't even enough time to fly all the stuff home between races, requiring even more work to fly two races worth of equipment from one location to another. Number 1. Too many drivers died in the 60s and 70s. Formula One is currently a dangerous sport, but it used to be a death trap. In the 50s, there wasn't a safety culture. It was just after the Second World War. People were used to the idea of people could die, and I think people found it almost acceptable. Indeed, safety simply wasn't a priority in Formula One, with seatbelts not even being required until 1972. Tracks like the infamous Nurburg Ring were upward of 15 miles long, which meant getting a safety car out to an accident was a time-consuming affair, as racing legend Niki Lauda found out the hard way burning alive in his car for more than an entire minute. Though Lauda survived and was able to continue his racing career, many were not so lucky. 29 Formula 1 drivers died racing in the 1960s while 18 died in the 1970s. It wasn't until Artin Senna's tragic death in 1994, before he'd even reached his prime, that safety became Formula 1's priority. Now only Jules Biaggi's tragic death in 2015 represents an outlier in what's become a relatively safe sport. However, some feel the increased safety measures detract from the essence of the sport, that is the looming prospect of death hovering over any mistake or human error. 
Former Formula One driver Anthony Davidson went on record to say that motorsports in general have lost their fear factor. Danger and the specter of death made F1 more exciting. But it's hard to say, with a clean conscience, that we'd rather see more drivers die in today's F1. That wraps up the video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel and don't forget to press the bell icon to stay notified on more videos about our amazing world.